Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It is Wacky and Weird Wednesday here on the first week of March. So what weird things have been going on this week? We're about to tell you, I guess. So let's go ahead and start the show. Today on Before Coffee. Kelvin Grove Museum. Protesters charged after pouring porridge on a bust. And scientists report on hyper-vaccinated man who has had a 217 COVID jabs. COVID jabs. Also in weird news, what in the hell is wrong with the New York Times? The Arctic could become ice-free within a decade. New study finds. And another weird news, we have balls out bowling and diving for watches. Afghan Youth Orc orchestra to perform in UK after home office U-turn on visa denial. Those stories and more, which is not only National Oreo Cookie Day, it is National Dentist Day by coincidence. March 6th, 2024 on Before Coffee. All right, our first news stories coming out of the wacky and weird side of the news. This first one is from The National by Laura Pollock. Two members of a campaign group have been charged after they poured porridge and jam on a bust of Queen Victoria and sprayed the painted words cunt on the plinth of Glasgow's Kelvin Grove Art Val Gallery and Museum. I'm not going to... We've already decided that word has entered the lexicon. It's no longer a bad word to say. <laughs> Sosha Ni Martin, 30, and Hannah Taylor, 23, from This Is Rigged, carried out the actions around midday before reportedly gluing themselves to the plinth. The group said it carried out the act to protest against increasing, increasing food insecurity. Nee Martin, an Irish activist and community food worker in Glasgow, said, We refuse to be dragged back to the Victorian era. Diseases of starvation, including scurvy and rickets, are on the rise. Freedom begins with breakfast. And you can't understand that, we'll shove it in your face. Food is a human right, and we call out the rotten systems under which we are suffering. Other stunts carried out by the group this year include occupying the royal dining room at the Palace of the Holyrood House. This is rigged, has said it will continue to carry out similar actions until its demands are met, which includes supermarkets reducing the price of baby formula to March 2021 prices and the Scottish government funding and implementing a community food hub in every 500 households in Scotland. Spokesperson from Police Scotland told PA, around 11.55 a.m. on March, Sunday, March 3, 2024, Police were called to report a protest and alleged vandalism within the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum, Kelvin Grove Park, Glasgow. Two women aged 23 and 30 have been arrested and charged following the incident. They have been released on an under and are undertaking to appear at the Glasgow Sheriff Court on a later date. A report will be submitted to the Procurator Fiscal. So there you go. There's your update on... Um, the UK is still having a food crisis because now people are getting angry and angry, I guess. And yeah, scurvy is not fun. I don't know if you know what happens when you get scurvy, scurvy but it's not fun. It's left over. It's left over from the 1500s, huh? Yeah. Scurvy. Okay. Scurvy. Speaking of pirates. All right, in our next pleurisy. short story on Weird and Wacky Wednesday, we've got from Irish News by Ella Pickover, the PA health correspondent. Scientists have reported the case of a hyper-vaccinated man who has reportedly received 217 COVID-19 jabs. The man from Germany had dozens of vaccines for private reasons over a period of 29 months, according to a study published in the journal Lancet Infectious Diseases. The 62-year-old from Magdeburg, Germany, had no signs of ever being infected with the virus that causes COVID-19 and had not reported any vaccine-related side effects, the researchers from the University of Erlangen-Nuremberg said. Nuremberg, sorry, Nuremberg. 
Academics heard about the man in a newspaper and asked if they could study his body response to multiple jabs. We learned about his case via newspaper articles, Dr. Killian Schuber said. We then contacted him and invited him to undergo various tests in Erlangen. He was very interested in doing so. There is an official confirmation for 134 four of these vaccines, including eight different vaccines, the team said. The observation that no noticeable side effects were triggered in spite of this extraordinary hypervaccination indicates that the drugs have a good degree of tolerability, Dr. Schruber added. Researchers looked at the previous blood test the man had and also examined blood samples as he went on to receive further vaccinations. Dr. Schruber continued, The individual has undergone various blood tests over recent years. He has given us permission to access these results of these analyses. In some cases, samples have been frozen, and we are able to investigate these ourselves. We were also able to take blood samples ourselves when the man received a further vaccination during the study at his own in insistence. We were able to use these samples to determine exactly how the immune system reacts to the vaccinations. Researchers found that his immune system was fully functional. Certain immune cells and antibodies against the virus which caused COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, were present in considerable high levels compared to people who had received just three vaccines, the team reported. Overall, we do not find any indication for a weak and remote immune response. Rather, the contrary, says one of the leading study authors, Katharina Kocher. People in the UK will have received a maximum of seven jabs through the initial vaccination program and subsequent booster jabs. Many working age adults with no underlying health conditions will have had three jabs, two in the initial program and a booster. I have to agree with that as a, I'm not living in the UK, but I'm living in the Netherlands and I only had the first jab, a booster, and then another booster. And that was what, October 2021, I think is when we went to when we went to uh, Greece, that's the last time I've had a shot. Um, I, don't, I haven't gotten sick either of anything since then, but that might be my own uh, consistency in washing my hands and not trusting anybody. Your precautions. So, <laughs> right. Your own isolation. Yeah, I'm a I'm an isolated issue. Um, but yeah. You come pre-quarantine. <laughs> pre-quarantine. I definitely got sick, but I'm, only once. Yeah. I'm pre-quarantined myself. I, yeah. I have no time for public spaces. I mean, I don't mind airports and trains so much are necessary, but then again, I don't breathe all over people while I'm on them. So, <laughs> You're not hi there, I'm on spaces. a train. Let me breathe right in your face. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, we're knows in a serious vein. This is from salon.com, written by... Lucian K. Truscott the Fourth. Wow. No, you're serious. If you got a IV after your name. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is not the same question as why is the New York Times sucks. Is their headline says there's something wrong at the New York Times from presidential polls to refusing to report on Trump stumbles. Things aren't adding up at the Gray Lady. They used to call it the Gray Lady. <laughs> Oh, really? uh, okay. They famously had a female editor for a long time, too. Okay. Um, you got mm, lost? Good thing. Yeah, no, I was just reading the headline that was part of a picture. Uh, so okay. I was, just, was that part of the story? No. <laughs> Two things. Check that. Three things appear to have gone off the rails at the paper we used to call the Grey Lady. First, whatever or whoever's in charge of the paper paper's polls is not doing their job second whoever is choosing what to emphasize in the times coverage of the campaign for the presidency is showing bias third the times is obsessed with joe biden's age at the same time they're leaving evidence of John donald trump's mental and verbal stumbles completely out of the news as if uh -oh. donald trump's a spring chicken like he's a little <laughs> kid oh he's so young and bright no Oh, he's, he's a, a scary, scary old man, old man who's yeah. totally confused about where he is and who he's running against. He's he doesn't even know who the president he, is. He thinks he's still in the 90s. That's where he is living. God. Trump keeps calling, saying, insisting that Obama is president. Okay, back <laughs> to the article. Let's start right there. 
At a rally Saturday night in Virginia, Trump confused Barack Obama, who left office seven years ago with President Biden for a third time over the last six months. He's also confused Nikki Haley with Hillary Clinton and with uh, Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. I, like, all women are the same person to him, right? I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. All right. Anyway, for the third time in the last six months, at least, he's he's uh, thinks Obama is president. He said Putin has so little respect for Obama that he's starting to throw around the nuclear word. Trump said as his crowd of rabid supporters suddenly fell silent. They they realized, wow, you heard that nuclear? He's starting to talk nuclear weapons today. Hey. <laughs> you won't find that verbal stumble and I'm the crowd's stunned reaction to. The, in the Times coverage of the campaign over the weekend, you'll have to read other in, in other publications, for example, Salon or maybe The Guardian. If you want to learn how often Trump losing his way mid-sentence at rallies and just mumbling incoherently, the Times on Sunday, however, had its headlines ready for your morning coffee. Majority of Biden's 2020 voters say now say he's too old to be effective. It's another grab from the New York Times Siena College poll they published on Saturday that is so outrageously flawed a cottage industry has sprung up to pick apart its methodology and point out its glaring contradictions and straight up bias. A favorite of poll skeptics is its start sampling bias. How did the New York Times come up with a polling sample that included 36% rural voters when the 2020 population of rural voters is 19%. Somehow, the poll sample of female voters was equally skewed. The poll found Trump winning the female vote by 1% when Biden carried women in 2020 by 11 points. The Times wants you to ignore that. In between, all three of Trump's Supreme Court justices courted back the Dobbs decision overturning women's constitutional right to abortion, followed by almost immediately by states banning abortions all over the country, many with no exceptions for rape or incest. The time doesn't say how it squares with its polls numbers with the fact that women turned out in huge numbers to help win referendums confirming the right to abortion, including such Republican strongholds as Kansas and Kentucky, and handed every special election to Democratic candidates in the bargain. They just want you to believe there's a been a 12-point swing towards Trump among women, and there's no evidence except, poof, it happened. If you're getting off the subway anywhere near 8th Avenue and 42nd Street, hold your nose. There's something fishy at the New York Times. That's where they're building us, apparently. Okay. The truly incredible thing is that the New York Times provides the evidence that would cause any other reasonable journalistic enterprise to question the accuracy of its own poll. The poll shows that Trump still has the support of nearly every Republican who voted for him in 2020. This is in the face of the fact that between 30 and 40 percent of primary voters have chosen another candidate than Trump. Those people are not poll responders. They're voters. The Times Siena poll also somehow comes up with 12 percent support among Democrats for Rep. Dean Phillips. You don't, Do you even know who that is? Dean Phillips. I've heard their I name. I told you Dean I Phillips. I don't know him. Okay. He's a Democratic congressman running against Biden, okay? But okay. you barely know who he is, okay? The time Siena poll somehow comes with 12% poll among Democrats for Rep. Dean Phillips, who has yet to get more than 2% of the vote in any primary. Even Phillips himself posted a tweet that said, when the New York Times Siena poll shows me at 12%, you better believe it's flawed. Only 5% even know who I am. The poll also <laughs> shows that among the guy who got 12% doesn't believe the poll. He's like, that's yeah. horseshit. The poll also shows that among respondents who describe themselves as unhappy with both candidates, they favor Biden over Trump by 12 points. So Biden has an utterly disaffected vote and carries independence by four points, and he's losing to Trump by four points? That doesn't add up. Why is the New York Times missing the red flags in its own polls? More important, why has the paper decided to give its own deeply biased poll results such heavy play? I don't want to bring up butter emails, but for crying out loud, why is the New York Times so clearly making the same mistakes of bias and emphasis they made in the 2016 covering Hillary Clinton all over again? The Times was drawn down on Clinton for months because of her so-called email scandal that wasn't a scandal at all. And when the Russian intelligence leaked Democratic Party emails through WikiLeaks in the fall of 2016, 
Reading the Times, you would think that each and every DNC email that nobody bothered reading was a smoking gun. None of the daily drumbeat of manufactured news added up to even a pinprick of scandal. That's right, no charges, no nothing, and not a damn thing was there. But the Times did with the Whitewater and the rest of the made up Clinton scandals, the paper simply couldn't resist filling its front page with negative stories about the Democratic candidate for president. There are no scandals with the there are no scandals with the name Biden attached to them, unless you consider the lies Russian spies supplied to the so-called impeachment committee with. So the New York Times has apparently devoted half of a floor to its 8th Avenue headquarters to a search for bad news about Biden. And then they reserve a space nearly every day above the fold of the front page for whatever grain of grim shit the Biden hunters had managed to come up with. They're probably working with a story on how Biden is losing the pro-choice vote as we speak, while pointing out the wild success of Trump's move to the middle on abortion with centrist voters. If you're not getting off the subway, if you're getting off the subway anywhere, okay. Is it the I'm same joke again? again? That's about it. Hold your nose. <laughs> yeah, they ran that. Yeah, they ran that. The, it might be part of the picture or something. Oh, okay. Picture caption, but that's it. That's the story. That's the end of Lucian K. Truscott the Fourth. Little story, little opinion piece in Salon. What the hell? That's a weird news because well, you have nobody is going to believe a poll that gives Dean Phillips twelve percent. Sorry. <laughs> You have been complaining about no. uh, New York Times. Yeah, I as subscribed well. to New York Times. I dropped my subscription because I was like, "Why am I reading this story? It's <laughs> it, it's leaving out every fact I can think of." And it keep, the thing they kept doing is they kept calling Trump president as if he's still president. It's like, what are you what are you trying to do? Right? They're trying to mm -hmm. sell papers, and it's it's sad and it's pathetic. The Washington Post also is crap now, and they want a pay window for it just to look at their. The front page yeah like no your papers suck you're trying for you're trying for clicks you're not trying to report the actual facts you forgot what your job is back to you <laughs> forgot what your job is all right i mean reporters are always going to be biased that's normal but it was just the bias you didn't like so yeah you shouldn't pay them if they're gonna support a different perspective that is just like i don't care about this I mean, that's we're biased. Obviously, I can get we're free quite news biased. Why should I pay for a news is biased? Yeah. All right, coming out of the Arctic. This is weird and wacky news, but in a negative way, not really a fun way. Uh, the Arctic could mm. become ice free, so start planning your uh, summer vacations there, because oh the sun's out for like 24, 24 hours a day during the summer. So hey. <laughs> You can party all day long. <laughs> the ice-free Arctic inevitable is a inevitable. But the good news is the polar region can quickly bounce back if we cut CO2 emissions. The Arctic could experience its first ice-free day in the next couple of years, scientists predict. A new study from the University of Colorado Boulder in the U.S. finds this critical brink could be passed more than 10 years earlier than previously expected. It's not quite as drastic as it sounds. For scientists, an ice-free Arctic doesn't mean the world would be there would be zero ice in the water. The polar region would be considered free of ice when the ice ocean has less than one million square meters of ice. Square kilometers, sorry, of ice. But that's a huge depletion from where it stood just decades ago. The threshold represents less than 20% of what the Arctic's minimal ice cover was in the 1980s. In recent years, the Arctic Ocean has around 3.3 million square kilometers of sea ice at its minimum in September. When it comes to communicating what scientists expect to happen in the Arctic, it is important to predict when we might observe the first ice-free conditions in the Arctic, which will show up in the daily satellite data, says Alexandra Jean, Associate Professor of Atmospheric and Oceanic Scientist at CU Boulder's Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research. So they're an expert at the Arctic. Jean and her colleagues analyze existing literature on sea ice projections as well as data from computational climate models to see how the Arctic might change in daily in the future. The findings published in the journal Nature Reviews of Earth and Environment Today outline the consequences of baked-in climate change, show why emissions cuts are urgently needed. 
One late August, early September day, this decade and the next, scientists predict the Arctic could become ice-free for the first time. The bad news is that it's likely under all emission scenarios. Most projections have focused on when the polar region will be ice-free for a month or more, which researchers expect to happen by mid-century. In the new study, John's team found the first days when sea ice covered coverage dips below one square kilometer threshold would occur on average four years earlier than the monthly averages, but could occur up to 18 years earlier. It could happen as soon as the next couple of years, the study says, with greenhouse gas emissions mainly to blame for sea ice loss. So how is the sea ice declining impacting people and wildlife? Well, we already know about the polar bears. Benching snow and ice cover in the Arctic is part of the feedback loop, as it means more heat from the sunlight is being absorbed by the ocean. This exacerbates ice melt and warming, with perilous impacts for Arctic animals that rely on sea ice for survival, including seals and polar bears. The good news is the Arctic Sea is ice is resilient and can return quickly if the atmosphere cools down. Unlike the ice sheet in Greenland that took thousands of years to build, even if we melt all the Arctic sea ice, if we can figure out how to take CO2 back out of the atmosphere in the future of reverse warming, sea ice will come back within a decade, John says. So, I think we've gone over this before on the show, but to make it clear, the reason we care about ice is because ice reflects UV rays. And that's why the Earth is getting warmer, not just simply through greenhouse gases, but also because less of it is being reflected back out into space, more of it is being absorbed by our ocean water and our lake water, and that's why the Earth is getting warmer. Because we're not reflecting all of it back out. So, and then, of course, with greenhouse gas emissions, we're keeping all that heat in like a cozy little blanket as we slowly die of heat exhaustion. So let's go ahead and stop using CO2, or I guess not stop using it, but start expulsing it. You know, uh, eat locally. Don't give money to those corporate agricultural farms that have th thousands and thousands of cows because those people are not helping. Your local cow farm, though, go ahead and support them because five cows aren't going to do anything compared to thousands of them. Uh, that's my advice for you today. On to your story. Okay. Uh, I don't know, but your audio cut out about halfway through your, or like two, three minutes ago, just now came back on my end. I don't yeah. know. I don't know if your audio went out generally, but I didn't hear you for like two minutes. So. Okay. Well, we'll find out later. And I guess you didn't hear me. No. Guess you didn't hear me because you didn't have your headphones on. So, no. so uh, I don't know. You were choppy the whole time, and then you cut out completely. So, I don't. You hear me at all? I'm waiting for your story. Okay. There's your <laughs> audio again. Being choppy. Okay. All right. So we got stories on nude bowling. This is uh. United Press International, I was all worried about your audio, so I completely forgot what I was doing. Uh, this is from Ben, ha ben Hooper from the United Press International, UPI.com. Pittsburgh area naturalists announced an upcoming Balls Out bowling event in which nudism fans will be able to roll in the buff. A Pennsylvania natural, nat naturalism club Announced bowlers will be able to roll in the nude at its upcoming Balls Out Bowling event. Balls Out Bowling. Pittsburgh Area Naturalist Group announced that it has rented out Crafton Ingram Lanes in Pittsburgh for its Bowling in the Buff event April 28th. Nudity is required, with the exception of the women who wear bottoms. The group said the event page, please bring a towel and bag for your belongings. Anyone who wants to shed their clothes for a night of Balls Out Bowling needs to purchase a $25 ticket in advance. Balls Out Bowling is the ultimate bowling experience for anyone who loves to have fun and show off their skills in the buff, the group said. The event is open to bowling fans at all skill levels or over the age of 18. The group stressed that safety and privacy will be paramount during the event with no photography or video recording allowed. Sexual activity is not permitted. Nudism does not equal consent. Nudism does not equal uh, does not equal consent, and harassment will not be taken lightly. Violators will be asked to leave. The event page states. Another weird news, also from UPI. 
This is from Ben Hooper again. Nudis, uh, nudis, man, he's not a nudist, he's a diver. Diver has found over 200, or about 200 Apple Watches in Indiana Lake. Scuba diver Derek Langos. The Illinois diver who has recovered about 200 Apple Watches from the bottoms of lakes has a warning for owners. Don't go swimming with the original watch bands. Derek Langos, a, a Port Barrington scuba diver who makes a living using his metal detector to recover lost items in the water at Indiana's Chano Lakes, said he has found about 200 Apple smartwatches during his dives. Lango's operator at the Scuba Bear Diving Recovery Service said nearly all of the watches have their original bands attached. The ones are the sports bands. They do not stay on in the water, Lango's told the, the Shaw local. Lango's said that he was hired to find some of the watches while others he came across during his own dives. He said he keeps everything he finds in the water in the hopes of returning them to their owners. I haven't sold anything, including a white gold Cartier ring, unless I get it back to the owner, he said. Lango said the other items he frequently finds underwater include smartphones, rings, jewelry, and prescription glasses. So yeah, if you're buying a smartphone and you think you're going to go swimming with it, don't. They're going to lose it. And in other weird news, well, this is enlightening news anyway. World's oldest person celebrates 117th birthday in Spain. The oldest living person, Maria Brañas Morena, Maria, is celebrating her 107th birthday Monday in Spain. This Monday, two days ago. Morena, who was born March 4th, 1907 in San Francisco, has lived in Catalonia, Spain since she was eight years old and has been residing at the same nursing home for the past 23 years. Maria was named the oldest living person by the Guinness World Records in January 23, following the death of a French woman, Lucille Randon, at the age of 118. She is very grateful for all the congratulations received and the interest that so many people have shown in her state of her health. Ava Carrera Boix, the director of Maria's nursing home, told Guinness World Records. She is happy to be able to celebrate her special day intimately with her family and colleagues and wishes everyone a happy Monday, Boix said. Herrera remains active in her nursing home and maintains a social media presence on X Twitter with help from her 80 year old daughter. Good morning, world. Today I turn 117 years old. I have come this far, she wrote Monday. Herrera is currently the 12th oldest verified person in history and would rise to number five spot if she makes it to her 118th birthday. So happy belated birthday to Maria and let's let's make it to 200. What do you say? Yeah, let's all get there. Yeah, she's been legal drinking age five times. Wow. Well, if you're 105, you've been there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so back to you. Hopefully All I right. can hear you the whole time. <laughs> All right. My, let's go ahead and cover our culture segment with, which is about the Afghan Youth Orchestra. This is from Irish News by Ellie Ng, P.A., now, we've talked about the UK Home Office's issues with immigrants before, I think, last year when they were denying bands from touring because they would file as touring musicians, but they also have a job where they're an accountant. So then, oh, you're illegally telling us what job you do. It's like, well, I am here to tour with my band. The fact that I'm an accountant should not be relevant for anything else, you know? but. As usual, the UK uh, entry visas are very annoying and troublesome. I hate going to the UK because of this, actually. Because I never liked going there because I hate their border control. It's just as bad as the US's border control. You always feel like you're doing something wrong. It's like, I'm just, why are you here? I'm literally here for one day. Get off my back. Like, but yeah. Anyways, other than my personal, uh, investment in this idea. The Afghan Youth Orchestra will now be allowed to perform in the UK after the Home Office reversed its decision to deny the group visas for entry. The AO AYO was due to perform at the South Bank Centre in London on Thursday as part of 
which was Thursday was the 29th of February as part of its Breaking the Silence tour and the venue's South Asian Sounds Festival before going on perform concerts in Liverpool, Man Manchester and Birmingham. The Sama Arts Network, which to organize the tour, confirmed that to the home office had you turned on its decision on Monday an evening to deny AYO entry visas. The group fled Afghanistan after the Taliban returned to power. Sama Artistic Director J. Vis Va Deva told BBC Radio's 4, the World's Tonight program, the good news has traveled to me from Portugal that the Home Office has finally seen light of the day. The group, an ensemble of Afghanistan National Institute of Music, ANIM, had expressed its profound disappointment over the visa refusals in a statement on ANIM's website and called on the government department to reconsider its decision. The statement added, the visa refusal not only dealt a significant blow to the young musicians' aspirations, but also deprived these young musicians an opportunity to raise awareness through music about the gender apartheid against Afghan women and denial of cultural rights of the Afghan people by the Taliban. Dr. Ahmed Sarmast, head of ANIM, said he was delighted to learn of the U-turn, adding the new decision of the Home Office will enable members of the AYO not only to share their beauty of Afghan music with the audience in four UK cities, but also to make music with young British musicians who join us each in each city and further this latest development allows these young musicians to raise awareness about the ban on music in Afghanistan and systematic denial of women's rights by the Taliban. The group fled Afghanistan after the return of the Taliban, and its musicians have lived and studied in Portugal, where they were granted asylum since December 2021. The orchestra has toured Switzerland, Germany, Italy, and Tajikistan in recent months. Afghan uh, Diana Johnson, chairwoman of the Home Affairs Select Committee, posted on Twitter that the reverse of the Home Office decision was excellent news. It is understood that South Bank Center performance will be rearranged, with relevant organizations looking at a possible date next week. A Home Office spokesperson said musicians and performers are valued and important part of the UK culture. So then why did they get denied? Who denied them? I need their name? I need to know where they live? No, I'm just kidding. Applications have been <laughs> considered on their individual merits in accordance with immigration rules, with a responsibility on applicants to demonstrate they meet these rules. It is understood that the Home Office is working with organizers to ensure that consent is obtained for the minors to travel. A Home Office spokesperson said, Musicians and performers are valued an important part of UK culture. Applications must be considered on their individual merits. We already said that. Why are we repeating the same quote again? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's weird. So, whilst their initial application was refused, after the provision of additional information, we are pleased that they will be able to travel as soon as possible. So I guess I was thinking this was a racist thing because I always do. I am American after all, but maybe it was simply just, do these children have their parental consent to be traveling all over the world? Uh, it's really weird because it's not like they came directly from Afghanistan. They've been living in Portugal since 2021. So that's probably what, I don't know if they have passports, Afghanistanian passports, or if they have like Portuguese asylum passports no idea what paperwork they presented but i guess that paperwork wasn't good enough and they had to do another review but if you're go if you're living in london or live in the uk i guess check them out and give them the attention they deserve for fighting for the country from afar now i guess in this day in history okay for this day in history we uh I screwed up on Monday and I gave you March 6th uh, day in history. So before I do that, I'm going to give you March 4th day in history real quick because that was confusing as hell. <laughs> so let's go back to Monday and pretend it's March 4th. 1461, King Henry VI, England was deposed by Yorkists and replaced by Edward IV. Uh, 1678, Italian composer and violinist Antonio Vivaldi, who left the decisive mark in the form of concerto in a style of late Baroque instrumental music, was born in 1681. William Penn secured from King Charles II of England the colonial province of Pennsylvania in North America, hoping to provide a refuge in the New World for Quakers and other persecuted people and to build an ideal Christian commonwealth. 
1789 on March 4th, the U.S. Constitution went into effect as a governing law in the United States, the date having been established by, excuse me, Congress. And 1804, Irish convicts rose up in the Castle Hill Rising, Australia's first rebellion. In 1837, Chicago was incorporated with, as a city with a population of about 4,200. In 1888, Gridiron football coach Newt Rockne was born in Voss, Norway. University of Notre Dame legendary Newt Rockne football coach. 1933, government official Francis Perkins was sworn in the U.S. Secretary of Labor on the administration of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. She was the first woman appointed to a cabinet post. Hell yeah. 1982, Canadian jurist Bertha Wilson became the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada in 1982. In 2009, American playwright and screenwriter Herman Foote, who evoked American life, in beautifully observed minimal stories and was perhaps best known for his adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird, died in Connecticut. And our featured event was the inauguration of U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt on this day in 1933, not on this day, on March 4th, which we did play part of his speech, the S not, uh, what, um, the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. That we played that on Monday and other birthdays. Uh, Miriam Makiba, South African singer, born March 4th, 1932. Bobby Womack, American singer, songwriter, and guitarist, born in 1944. Rick Berry, American politician, born in 1950. And Landon Donovan, uh, American soccer player, born in 1982. And Khalid Husini, American author. Born in 1965. Those are your featured birthdays for two days ago. <laughs> As for today, we covered all that on Monday. But we just want to bring up that this is the 100th anniversary of King Tut. And this day, in 1924, the Egyptian government opened the mummy of King Tutankhamun, ruler of Egypt, in the 14th century BCE, whose Burial chamber had been discovered in 1922 by renowned British archaeologist Howard Carter. So that's your day in history today. And what national day is it today? It is National Dentist Day, National Frozen Food Day, National Oreo Cookie Day, National Dress Day. Oh, if you can make a dress out of frozen food, you got something. And it's National White Chocolate Cheesecake. Specific type of cheesecake. With the white chocolate, which a lot of people don't like. Some people are like, this don't taste like chocolate at all. <laughs> but then again, chocolate doesn't taste like chocolate until you add sugar. That's true. Anyway, those are your days for today, which is March 6th, 2024. I'm the Beth Lacate. <laughs> I can't say it in French. I can try. Let me see. Yeah, yeah, look it up. Spanish. Spanish. It's hard. I just did it, man. It was hard. <laughs> yeah. It was difficult, let's say. <laughs> All right. Let me just do that. Let's try French. French, French, French. Finish. Finish is gonna even more of a difficulty. Did you find oh, it in French? Yeah, it's really hard to say. She says it really fast. <laughs> I have to, look, have to play it back fifty times. <laughs> Reading it's out of the question because <laughs> none of the words are pronounced the way they look like. Say estores en bien. That's the same word for Spanish. Yeah, they're both Latin anyway, languages. I'm not doing that. Okay. <laughs> Back to you. All right, this has been Allison we'll here practice. from the Netherlands where the sun is shining brightly and we are getting ready for our holiday in uh, the Arctic in September. So <laughs> get your tickets now. Um, uh, I hope tomorrow is our 
themeless Thursday where we're just going to talk about normal news like mucking fun day. And we'll see you then. Here is your mic drop moment. Tick, tack. Tick, tock. Enjoying Tick. yourself, Batman. Tick. The dreaded ancient Tick. Theban pebble torture. Tack. You Tick. pitiable Tick. madman. Tick. Chief Tick. Torturer, Tick. what's the pebble count on my faithless ex queen? Tick. 901, old oh, great pharaoh. 901, good. Less than a hundred to go. And then she'll smash herself to pieces trying to tear herself out of a jar. In the name of mercy, think back to the days when you were a distinguished professor at Yale University. Give yourself up. I vow that you receive the finest Dick. medical attention. Chief Torturer Ho! What's the pebble count on Batman? Dick. 297, Dick. old great pharaoh. Dick. Speed it up! Let it be a warning, loyal subjects. Our enemies shall be reduced, even as these, to mindless slaves. Smash open their cases. Dance, you slaves. Dance for our amusement. Music. Bat music. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons. Follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.